Welcome to episode 39 of the Camera Shape podcast, the podcast where we talk about anything and everything that's got anything to do with photography, filmmaking, making photos, making videos, and anything and everything that sounds like that's got anything to do with that. Anyway, today we've got another really special guest, um, Mr. Kai Zemet, videographer, filmmaker, and father of two on the show today. Kai, how are you doing? Very good. Hello, starters. Uh, yeah, all good. Healthy, you know, keeping safe and trying to semi-homeschool at the same time. <laughs> so. Excellent. So are you, uh, are you working from home at the moment or what's the, what's the situation where you are? It's a mixture, actually. Um, we've just, well, we've packed, well, it's very busy for Christmas. Really busy, actually, um, quite surprisingly. And um, yeah, and then we took a the Christmas break about to come back and obviously uh, new rules and regulations have come in so it's a case of right so i've taken a second machine i have two machines so i'm working at home at the moment to sort of you know to answer your question so yeah so mainly from home at the moment with the occasional job that's coming in cool so just to explain to our audience uh, what it is that you do so you're based down in eastbourne by the coast yeah and, that's right yeah and so you're you're a videographer and filmmaker Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so I um, I term myself more as a filmmaker rather than a videographer. And the reason being is the fact that uh, I work for a company called Smokescreen Visuals. I'm creative director there now. And uh, it's more the fact that we don't make videos, we make films. You know, the next level up, um, you know, in, and so, yeah, so in, in Eastbourne, which is great, you know, so East Sussex. Yeah. So how, how has um, how's 2020 been for you? It was a... Uh, a surprising year, um, you know, going into it, you know, there was rumors about this virus, you know, and, and things like that. But for me, mainly it was about this, you know, the second daughter coming along. That was all I really sort of focused in on. And, um, so my daughter came along in March and literally a week later went into lockdown. But the first one, you know, when, you know, everyone was a bit, oh, mm. a bit scared and, and stuff like that. And, um, I thought, well, that's it business is done. <laughs> oh. uh, even uh, my boss, uh, Matt, from Smokescreen Visuals, you know, we had a chat and we said, okay, well, what are we going to do? And uh, obviously the government brought in the furlough scheme, things, you know, and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so that side of things, you know, we, we decided to sort of stop shop, should we say. And then it was a case of um, lucky enough, well, bizarrely enough, I had a, a, an old friend of mine who, uh, NCT classes. So, uh, someone like my first daughter, we, all the mums and dads come together. If you don't know what NCT is, you know, all the mums, dads come together for the first time birth or maybe second, mm -hmm. whatever. And a guy in there actually, uh, runs his own business down in East Sussex, a, a huge uh, sort of tarmac company and, and hooked me up and said, um, are you able to do any sort of work for me? Well, you know, I'll, you know, I'll see what I can do. And in the end, it turned, it sort of skyrocketed into that job came along. And then the next job came along. I had to sort of come out of her like then. And it was the next one. I just, I've just had an absolutely nonstop year. Oh, <laughs> I, great. Yeah. I literally stopped in Christmas. It was literally all the way up till Christmas. It was just, I never saw my family in the end, which is, so the first bit I did. So the first part of lockdown, as I said, great, you know, really connecting my daughter and that, you know, the first one I was working all the time, second time really, close bond but yeah it's been absolutely bananas really regarding sort of filmmaking but it's sort of because of covid if that makes sense so uh, another client of mine they work a lot in schools they can't go into schools so we came up with this idea of making can i put it sort of like educational lessons but sort of like a netflix style mm -hmm. and so i've only had technically had about two clients but it's been repeat work all the time so mm. i thank my lucky stars for that really yeah that's that's amazing that you've been able to be so so busy during what has been an you know an awful time and whatnot but on the, on a re another positive note you've got to spend a little extra time with your newborn that yeah. a lot of people don't get the opportunity to do that so so much at the start what a fantastic bit of uh, yeah. bit of coincidence yeah it's um it's funny because we because a group of us are friends and we was having a sort of uh the, i think it was on new year's eve actually this whatsapp chat came about and said you know the good and the bad that came from 2020 and uh 
me and my wife sat there and we actually said it was actually a really good year for us. Um, mainly obviously because of my, my, my newborn. Um, but then actually work wise, it kept me sane. I think I would have gone, li- I'll have lost it. I yes. think I'm a bit of a rat, <laughs> I'm a bit wild. Um, and so obviously I used my, you know, my career sort of, I'm passionate about it and I use that way to sort of level myself out. So my wife was kind of glad in that way, but yeah, it's just mm. been, been absolutely bananas really. Yeah, I remember the uh, the last the last project that we worked on together. I uh, was back yeah. in Budapest. Do you remember in February? Yes, it was. It yeah. was. Yes, it was. It was the uh, the all nighter. The, yeah. The, <laughs> yeah, I just remember. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, we were out there, weren't we? I think that's yeah. the first time I met you. I believe um, you met Matt, haven't you? Yeah, yeah I think it, I think we've done two projects together. Actually, I think we did. There was another project we did. Um, and I can't remember where that was. <laughs> and do you know, actually, I think it was, I said that the other day to him and he's like, oh no, I think it was, I worked with, with Kirsten in, in the, I think it was Chelsea Stadium. I yes, think correct. it was. Yeah. yeah. And then I met you at Budapest, but then I'm positive I saw you beforehand. So it was your surname that, that made me laugh. That's how I always remembered your name. Because yeah. for us nuts, you know, for filmmakers, that's a lookup table. Yeah. So I'm like... <laughs> Exactly. So I've always wondered whether I should set up a YouTube channel called Kirsten Lutz Talks Lutz. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> the thing is, I, um, when you walked through the door and I was like, oh, I bet he's got a bag of like color grades ready to go. <laughs> like just front them <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That was kind of like my joke. And obviously then me and you really connected. Um, yeah. Actually, I bet it was, I think it was in London. I think it was in London. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it was in London. It was... Um, it was in one of the big hotels. I can't remember. Yeah, but we did, big, yeah we I did, remember that was actually the first time I met you because I remember um, doing it because I had to leave early because again that was an all nighter. I had to. I, yeah. We finished filming. I think three p.m. It took about three hours to get back down to South. I think I got here about seven p.m. and I didn't finish the project till seven a.m. and then yeah. I sent the client the film, and by that time I was absolutely. I was just, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Budapest was the worst one. That was absolutely. I finished the film one minute beforehand, before yeah. I gave it to the client. <laughs> uh, awesome. Just to explain what, what you know, what these projects have looked like normally, it's like we uh, we've worked together on a number of conferences, um, and it's usually they usually last over two, three days, something like that. Mm. And um, so, kind his, his team uh, film the whole thing. I do stills, and then for the the final. Uh, the final session on on the final day. That's usually when everything has to be compiled into like a final film, essentially. You know, and uh, and that's when it gets a little bit stressy, usually. Yeah, it's um. Well, the thing is, because you don't know the story, that's the thing. You you know, you're filming a conference. You know, in the conference, is just people talking, and obviously, we don't know what it is until you get there. You don't know if it's um, a praise, a new product, or, or or whatever. In this case, it was. It was just explaining what products were. And so I sat there literally the first night thinking, I've got out, I've got what hours and hours and hours of footage to go through again. Mm. And then, well, how am I going to tell a story? And then lucky enough, I like to think I'm pretty good at putting a story together, which I'll explain a little bit more about that in, in, if we ever cover my history, mm. uh, where I got that from. And then lucky enough, yeah, it's the story came together and then it's a case of delivering that story yeah and it was a case yeah. of you give it to them to the client who then play it to the whole to everyone that showed up to the conference at the very end and to what's give them a little bit of a motivational boost what's particularly annoying is that of course that's always the the last thing that happens at the conference on the final day and the night before is usually the social outing kind of day so usually out until the early hours in the morning filming and you know shooting um accompanying people on their social whatever Thing. Mm-hmm. I think we went to some club or something. I, can't, I just can't remember. I believe they had they. That was the night before. The, the night before yeah. the film had to be aired. It was their um, the award ceremony in there. Oh, case. that's right. That's yeah. Right. So it's a case of you can't stay to the very end because you've got less editing time. Mm. Um, but you you film as much as you think that you're safe to do to mm. again to get that story together, and then you go from there. The best thing about those conferences, if anyone ever has to do them, is do a little bit of prep work, get your timeline ready, get your intro ready, get the songs ready, because there's nothing worse than you get there, you've got no internet for some unknown reason, or you jump in, there's always problems, and it's a case of how to fix that. 
it's it's always good fun. I always think the best thing about these conferences is the food, personally. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. The, the funny thing is, the first time, the first night out there, I had um, I had allergic reaction to the food, so I, I was like, "This is a great start." So <laughs> I thought Matt, my, uh, my, my boss at the time, my, my colleague, I went with, I thought yeah. he would have to do the entire shoot uh, uh, after the second day. I was like, "I'm starting to feel a little bit." I remember, like, uh, I remember on the last day. Um, we were sitting around thinking like, you know, because the whole coronavirus COVID thing was starting to happen, you know, it was starting to happen like internationally, but it hadn't, you know, I think there was, there were like some individual cases that had kind of shown up uh, in the UK at that point. So that was at the very, very beginning. And I, I remember thinking like, I wonder if this is the last conference we'll be doing this year. Yeah. <laughs> who would have known that, you know, the yeah. year would have gone like that. Um, yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? But to be fair, you know, like thinking about being busy and stuff like that, most if people have been busy. It's mainly at home, isn't it? It's for us, you know, it's, I don't, well, I don't take yourselves, but like for me, I've done, only gone out a little bit. The rest of it is just been pure editing. And so that means more eating and more weight gain. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, uh, that's the da- downside to uh, 2020 for me. But who knows what 2021 will bring? I think one thing that people have to understand, especially if, you know, for, for I think a large part of our audience are, are photographers and maybe some some may not necessarily be that familiar with the kind of filmmaking process. Yeah. But what you'll find is, is you always you just think that you spend, you know, a lot of time behind the camera. But the reality is, of course, you spend a lot of time in front of the screen editing. It's pretty um, it's pretty intense, isn't it, really? Because the thing is with it, you, you start something and it depends how much you love it. You know, either it be a client or just private work, you know, just for yourself, you know, say, for example, you're taking a picture of daughters or, or your dogs or, 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 again, a client. You want it to be perfect. And sometimes you get a little bit too, you know, a bit of a perfectionist. Well, I know I am. I spend way too long on certain things. I have to put almost like an egg timer out to actually remind myself not to do it. As, as you're going through an edit, when do you det- determine that's good enough? How do you balance that quality versus the amount of time you spend on a on a project? So for me, um, if it goes, I've always I've always put this up front. Actually, I've all, I'm a very slow editor, but the reason is I get it right the first time, and that sounds really big headed. And uh, the reason being is because I'll edit a, a sequence together and then I'll change it potentially three to four times. Mm-hmm where the client or anyone doesn't see that, but I do. And then I know I've got the best timeline, the best story, so to speak. And then it's a case of, well, it's what we call it, is we call it organic editing. So sometimes I'll have a client come up to me, it depends if it's for TV, because obviously that's 30 seconds or, or 60, whatever it may be. But when it comes to sort of online content, they'll say, look, I roughly want about a 30 second to a minute and a half. I, I don't know. It's up to... You know, I'll, I'll leave it down to you and I go, okay, well, do you want it 30 seconds or do you just want to see what happens? And then if they say we just want to see what happens, then that's when, again, I call it the organic editing because what will happen is I'll start it. Again, there's, the beginning is always the hardest part. Mm-hmm. And then I'll just let it flow, if that makes sense. The film has to flow. My eyes have to go from beginning to end and I have to watch it. And say, for example, I've sat there for four minutes but it only feels like a minute and I've done my job correctly. So that's how I know. Sometimes when I watch it, I go, oh, it's a bit too long. And then I'll cut it. I'll, I'll start trimming the fat, so mm-hmm. to speak. Or how can I reduce it even further? Um, it's very rare that if I give it to a client, they say, can you take time off? If they do, it's purely because it has to go like an Instagram film, for example. Or a reel, it's got to be what fifteen seconds, isn't it, or thirty seconds? Beg your pardon. So you, you you kind of have to sacrifice a little bit. But if it's anything for Facebook promotion work or just their website, yeah, it's very rare that I get that. Same as with the music choice, you just got to know. If that makes sense. Mm, yeah, it does. Absolutely does. So how long would you say a typical? Let's say it is a minute. There's so many variables. I appreciate that. How long does an edit typically take you for, say, a minute long? um film okay so i'm not too sure what other filmmakers are like it's a case of for me it goes in stages so i'll try and answer your question normally for me to make a film i like a week and the reason why i like a week is 
Uh, maybe if it's a minute, it obviously it's less than that. It's normally if it's like a minute and a half to two minute. And the reason is, I'll go through all the clips, every everything I've shot, I'll go through it again, and I'll in and out it, as you know, I'll make the sub clips, which is the best of the best, and I've got my selection. I then put that into the edit, I create the story, and as I've already explained, I'll go for it multiple times until I know it's right. Or sometimes I'll watch it back and go, a random idea will just pop into my head. Uh, I did that on my latest uh, project for, um, East, uh, for Sussex Police. I just had an idea and I just did it, and then it kind of added on a little bit more time. But then what I do is then I do a soundscape. And a soundscape is, always, for me, it's rather than just a bit of music with a little bit of ambience, I'll go the full works. I'll do ambience, I'll do foley work, so if they're moving their clothes or making sort of sound effects. If I'm watching something, my own films particularly, and I hear it in my head, so say for example they're drawing, that someone's drawing, and then I hear someone drawing, then I know I need to put a sound effect in. Mm-hmm. So I do all my soundscape and then I colour grade it, which is sort of my sort of speciality. I specialise in colour um, for smoke screen anyway. Um, and so then I'll, I'll grade it using potentially either my own LUTs or I'll look at a LUT and then I'll tweak it. You never get a LUT that's perfect, you know, that someone that you're borrowing someone's colour. But I think it's fine to, to borrow, but then tweak it, make it your own, because every film, as I call them, has its own entity. So that's why I like a week. To, to answer your question is because I do all that. And the reason is I have to do it that because it, my name's attached to it. So I want it to be the best thing ever. I want the client to be blown away. I want people watching it to be blown away. A lot of our, our viewers and listeners um, may be predominantly photographers yep. um, and not as many filmmakers amongst them. Mm-hmm. Um, could you, just for the benefit of our viewers and listeners, sort of talk a bit more about what color grading is versus say color correction you know in terms of a filmmaker um compared to photography i think when it comes to sort of color grading so you have so say for example i'll, I'll, I'll do it in a photography term so you've taken your still in my case i've taken 25 stills a second yeah so i've got my clip or 24 depending on or you're going to go 30 frames per second um you You've got your, your raw image. I'm assuming you're taking a raw. And in this case of, I've known some photographers, they, they have to have it perfect in camera. So they, how they take the photograph is how they actually want it. Where someone like myself will then take that photograph and I'll, for starters, I'll color correct it. So color correction and color grading are two different things. Color correction is correcting the blown out whites or the crushed blacks or the the kelvins and kelvin being you know as it is it too hot or is it too cold um and obviously if you're shooting a raw then obviously you've got all that metadata there that you can tweak so but then once you've done that so you've got it back to where the photograph or the video clip for example is perfect it's how it should be from your eye yeah and then that's, that's your color correction and color grade is something as I like to call it, it's the um, it's the magic that makes you feel. So if you want an image to be maybe sad, for example, then I'll apply heavy blues, especially to the blacks, and maybe draw the colour out, so take the saturation out to give it that. When you look at it, that's the first thing that hits you. You think Before you think, wow, that's a beautiful photograph, you understand what the feeling or, or the emotion is that you're meant to feel. And then, so for example, it, you want it to be warm, then you warm it up. Me, for example, colour grading, I do a lot of actually photographs from my, from my video work, actually. So what I would do is I'll take the still from it, normally from the colour graded version, and then I'll mask it up, I'll tweak it, I'll highlight like, you know, hair or eyes to make them pop, or I'll, I'll get certain areas of the skin where I want them to, the viewer to look, if that makes sense. Um, so, that's what I do when I'm taking sort of stills from video work. Um, but hopefully regarding, you know, difference between color grading and color correction, it's up to you. You don't have to do it. You might just want color correction and then you're happy with that. And then there's someone that's like myself that likes that their fo- for, you know, photographs to be a little bit more cinematic. You know, that's what I'll do. I'll color grade them, but then I also lift the blacks up 
or the contrast. I crushed the contrast a little bit to make it look like it's got a film noise on it or a film layer. So it almost looks like you can, you can touch it, it's texture. That's what I like anyway. So hopefully that, that explains it. <laughs> I, I, I personally think that's a fantastic explanation of the of the process, particularly if um, for those photographers out there who may not be familiar with film as much. I think that that nails it. That's exactly <laughs> how I would probably well, describe it myself. And the thing is, it's very important. I think from a photographer's perspective, it's very important to understand video yeah. or film and vice versa, you know, because, again, I get asked to do stills all the time from my video work. But not only that, most importantly, it makes you understand Concentrate on what you you are. So either you're a photographer or a filmmaker. You could be both, but there's going to be one that you you like to put your hat in. Yeah, on that shelf. But it makes you understand the other process, but it makes you better. So for me, for example, the first thing I did before I got my shooting style was understand composition and what do I like. So in my photographs, I like three layers. Normally, I like my foreground, my mayground, and my background. In, in, in sort of layman's terms, I don't know if everyone knows what that is. So if you're looking at your subject, which is your main ground, I'll put something in front of it. So your eye is instantly drawn to your subject. And then you've got your background, which is then either soft, vocal, or whatever it may be. So you've got three layers to your images, but that's how I film as well. So but I got that by looking at photography first, if yeah. that makes sense. And I think that's it's an important point is that, um, you know, Kirsten and I do a um, uh, photo video chat on a on a Tuesday evening, which is, I think, has been exclusively photographers who have been joining that over the last few few months. And you know, a lot of those guys say that they they've never really dabbled in video, and it's such a shame because if you can take a good photo with just a little bit of a different knowledge, just a little bit, you can take a great video as well. There's so many similarities, mm. particularly when it comes to things like composition. Mm. Um, yes, you've got to deal with um, using the video button and a little, you know, a couple of little different bits like that. But ultimately, it's the same. It's the same art. You just, think, you know, it's just, it's, it's. You're using time with your photo, as well mm. as rather than a single snapshot. So you know, anyone out there who's a photographer that isn't dabbling in video at all, just give it a go, and you'll see how similar. Uh, it really is. Yeah, I think we'll thank talk. That's awesome, awesome explanation. I love it. We'll talk about that in a second because that's. I think that's an uh, important point. So, I mean, my, my observation with that is, um, is that very often there's almost like, for, you know, for for somebody who comes from stills photography, there's almost like a fear factor involved when it when it comes to video, mm -hmm. and that's very often the obstacle or the barrier. Um, because taking an image is one thing, learning how to edit that, learning how to use Lightroom mm. and Photoshop and, you know, and all of that. Um, that's one thing, learning about, comp uh, about composition, learning about how to, how to use your camera, um, learning about focal length and exposure and all of that. Um, and the thought for a lot of photographers, I think for a lot of stills photographers, the thought of, of, uh, sort of facing another really steep learning curve when it comes to getting into video is that's what I find very often in conversation is that that what seems to be sort of the biggest obstacle. And I always think to myself that they've actually already walked most of the path mm. down, you know, because, because as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, the rules of composition are pretty much the same, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to, uh, to film or video, as compared to photography, um, you know, uh, composition is the same, uh, you know, focal lengths act in the same way. I mean, it, pretty much everything is, is really exposure is the same, I mean, the rules are all the same. So it's, a, it's, there isn't really, from a technical standpoint, there isn't really, um, that much, you know, there isn't really that much of a difference there. What the main difference I think is in the storytelling aspect yeah, and of course, in the post-production aspect. Um, and I think that's, you know, the whole editing side of things. That's what I feel. I very often um, does it, it does put people off, and I say that as somebody who obviously specializes in photography. But I actually started in video. That's that's where when I was a kid, that's what I did. It's like the first thing I ever bought was a video camera. <laughs> yeah, and this will make you laugh because I used to right get this. I used to basically edit my little films with the video camera, which was video eight. I don't know if you remember that format, like tape, you know, eight millimeter tape. 
yeah. basically. And it had a VHS um, VCR, and I used to press play on a camera and then record on a, on the VCR. And that's how I used to edit my my films together when I was yeah. a kid. That's, right? a, that's, a, that's definitely an old school way of uh, video yeah. editing. Yeah, this, this is like... That's what it was. Yeah, that's what I, that was like pre, you know, pre-computers. <laughs> that kind of ages me. Pre-computers, man. Computers haven't been invented yet. Well, obviously, <laughs> but it's not, we weren't really using them uh, for, for video editing. At least I couldn't afford a computer at the time that could do that. <laughs> um, but, but I found the transition into photography um, actually really easy at the time because that's, um, I, you know, I really got into uh, the composition and the placement and, you know, things like, th you know, working with different elements within the shot, foreground elements and mid-ground elements and backgrounds. And and the storytelling aspect was the one thing that's always totally fascinated me in video. Because that's that is really literally why I started playing around with a video camera when I was a kid, because I wanted to tell a story. Um, and I try to do the same in, in my stills photography now in a slightly different way, but it always comes back to the story. And I think you you mentioned at the beginning that the storytelling aspect for you is something that's that's really really important. Yeah, for me that is the all and be all. It doesn't matter if it's um, you know something really epic, you know like a drag race or something, or a carrier bag in the wind. Hmm. Yeah, it's how you d you tell the you capture the story and you deliver it. And yeah, that 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 is the most important thing. That and. That's what I like to think that makes me different. It wasn't that I went, I did go to film school, um, but it wasn't that that made me uh, the filmmaker or storyteller that I am. It was um, it's sort of like taking, basically what happened was, well, at my beginning of my sort of university career, uh, my granddad died actually, and he, he gave me a little, just a little bit of money. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna get myself a decent camera for the time, and it was a Canon 5D Mark II. All right, and I bought that because I thought to myself, I did hours and hours of research. If anyone knows me, like in person, they know how much of a stick I am for research, even for clients or whatever it is, just do your research. It always pays off. And um, I thought, I'd take, I'll buy that because I know it does really good video. It also takes really nice stills. Because again, I wasn't too sure. I knew I was doing a degree at the time, which is about to start a degree on and actually video editing, not filmmaking or, or, or video side. So I've got the camera and it was a case of after so much time, I was still using this, all these new cameras were coming out, state of the art. By then I actually knew that I actually had a bit of a flair for filming. And I actually heard at the time, because again, I was doing a post-production call, so video editing, that actually some of the best video editors can actually film. And, uh, and basically I worked that, Canon 5D Mark II to, to the bone. And I didn't have any money to buy new cameras that had state-of-the-art slow motion. You know, they could do 100 frames per second, you know, you know or 60, or shoot in low light. I had nothing. All I had was this, this Canon. So what that allowed me to do was to concentrate on becoming a storyteller. I was... So people were comparing my work to other people's work. Um, and... They were preferring my work because he had the story rather than the flashy slow motion mm. and, and anything like that. And and the, and the moment I knew I, I did it right was uh, the funny thing is at the time I worked at B and Q, I used to be a, a paint specialist. Obviously, goes with the color, the color, and and uh, I was mixing paint for this customer, and she said to me, "She went, oh, you are good at like your colors and things.' Oh, well, actually, I color grade footage is what I do." Um, photographs or whatever it is and then she said to me well actually i do i need a speaker reel i was like what the hell's a speaker reel i didn't say that at the time i thought i thought this and and that's actually a top tip if anyone asks you to do anything always say yes then figure out how to do it afterwards <laughs> and uh I, I said yeah well okay I'm, I'm up for it i had no idea how much to charge well i was i even gonna get paid or anything like that in the end i did get paid and it was actually at this time in her career she was quite a big speaker it was a it was a speaker in front of a bit like these conferences that we we're talking about earlier to a whole room for the people mm. i was like jesus oh my lord what, what am i going to do like i'm sort of this is my first ever paid client what am i going to do and then 
I shot, I just, I calmed down and I, I shot it how I would do it. And again, I went back to what I taught myself, which is story. But not only story, I also taught myself shooting style, which works for me. Um, if you want to cover shooting style, I'm more than happy to discuss it. And then the speaker reel, after it was done, went out. And to this day, people claim, in this, she's really big now, actually, as a speaker. She does all TED Talks and that. Um, people refer back to that speaker reel, saying it's one of the best things they've ever seen. And that's when I was like, wow, okay, I've actually done something really good. And that's when I, I started going down the road of looking at story. Hmm. And that's what kind of led me to go more video side than photography, because with a, for me, for a photograph, I can tell a story instantly, but it's it's instant and it's done. I want to be able to tell a story that's a little bit longer. You know, I want to, that makes sense. I want people to, even if it's 30 seconds or a minute, five minutes, you know, I want to make a feature film. I want people, I want to knock people for six and just take them out of the real world for a little bit longer than just a photograph or a piece of art, if that makes sense. Kai, do you determine what that story is going to be in pre-production or is it kind of slightly on the fly, depending on the situation once you arrive? That's a good question. Um, how, for me personally, I see it in my head instantly. This is how I actually became creative director at Smokescreen. I'll sit with a client or anyone and just talking to someone, we might throw some ideas about. And after about a minute or two, I start seeing it in my head. And my, and, my, and my quote that I always get, you know, I always say is, if I can see it in here, I can make it. Mm -hmm. So I had the other day uh, a, a director, writer friend of mine, um, asking me about, he wants to make a treatment. So treatment is um, like a little paragraph of trying to apply for a film to be made. So this is the story. This is the idea. Can I have your money to make it, basically, in, in the not so many words. And he said, look, I'm kind of, I've got this idea, but I, I have no idea how to visually do it. And so I asked him a few questions. Start as when's it sex? It's something about Sherlock Holmes and what's this, what's that? I, once I got those, I sat there for, I think it was about 30, 40 seconds and I could see it in my head. And I just typed up what I thought. And as if I was basically I closed my eyes really. And how, and I imagined a scene, just a scene. It doesn't have to be, anything to relate you to it. It was just a scene of someone sitting there, candle flickering. And, and that was able to tell me what the, the style of the film should be. So from that, I guess I could have made the story. So for me personally, to answer your question, I can see it there and then, but sometimes like those speaker reels or those conferences that we were referring to earlier, there's no storyboards. You just film and then you have to make the story in post-production. So if you film, for example, um, say 30 minutes worth of footage or, or no, maybe, I mean, let's say five minutes, you know, just in case you just want to dabble in film, make a story of it, make a 30 second film and or, or video and just see what, where it takes you. You'll have ideas and the more you do it, the better you get at it. That's what I found anyway. For some of our photographer um, listeners who may you know, who may be thinking about uh, giving video shot because I think the reality, this is, I always say to uh, to people uh, that, you know, if you have a fairly, fairly modern DSLR that's come out in the last six, seven years or something, you actually have an extremely capable video camera in your hands. Yeah. And if, I mean, we're not even talking about iPhones or whatever, but actually we all have very capable, you know, video machines right there. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, for somebody who wants to explore that a little bit, um, what would you say is like a really like a really good little exercise to do, just to kind of get into maybe the whole storytelling aspect of it? First thing is shooting style. They, you guys and girls, should already have that because you know what it is you like when you take your own photographs, and apply that to your films, your or videos, and to start off with. Do something small. Do something you like. So either maybe a hobby, your dog, your cat, your wife, cooking, gaming. I don't know. Whatever it is that you like, and and go and go from there. Really, you know, like as I said before, um, <laughs> before um, when I first started, we're all we're all the same. Everything's super wide. Don't do don't do that. Get really close. You know, you want you want to be close because that's how you tell the story with intimacy. If you're telling someone you love them, 
You don't want a shot that's really wide unless it's a beautiful waterfall. You want it to be someone looking at someone else, their eyes, their, their body language. So even if it's the first thing should be choose something easy, carry a bag in the window, as I said, a leaf, something like that. Don't, shooting animals is actually quite difficult, <laughs> but I'm sure just get some footage. Just get a couple of minutes of footage, shoot it on your, preferably shoot it on your DSLR rather than an iPhone because or, or, or a mobile phone. Um, the principles are the same. It just, it, the thing is a mobile phone will do all it for you and you don't get what you actually want. When you've got full control over everything, it makes you a better storyteller because you then learn from your mistakes. Oh, I've overexposed that or that's underexposed or, oh, it's not quite sharp enough. I've got the focus. The focus is wrong because I was concentrating on the ISO. So, and it makes something really tiny and then watch it. And if you feel like you watch it all the way through 15 seconds, a minute, and, you, and you're not bored and you can tell what it is, you've got an outcome to it. So even if, again, it's a leaf, just flapping, you know, going along the, the path or a carrier bag, whatever it may be. As long as you understand by the end of it, what it is that you wanted to tell, you're fine. And the most important thing is, do it for you. Don't do it for anyone else. If I ever make films, obviously I have to listen to the client, but I do something that I feel is right. I do it, you know, in the same way if someone ever asked me to make a feature film, I would make a feature film that I would want to see. So make a film or video clip that you want to see. You do your photography because you want to see it. It's your perspective of the world. We all look, we all look at the thing the same, but each one of us actually looks at it slightly different. So that's my, you know, way into it is start small, something you like and enjoy doing it. That's the most important thing. Such good ad advice for anyone out there. Um, Kai, would there be, do you have um, particular elements um, to a story that you always want to make sure kind of get in there? Uh, I don't mean start, middle and end, <laughs> but, um, you know, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> you know, are there particular things that you go into a project knowing, I need to make sure that that kind of an element is there, that that kind of an element is there. Cause I know that in my style of storytelling, that that's going to see me through and I'm not going to miss anything, I guess. What is the point of it? Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing. Again, even if it's something as simple as a dog running around, well, what, what are you trying to tell? Is the dog just running around because he's free? He's happy with his life. You know, there's two points there. He wants, he's doing something or she's doing something because they want a reward. You tell the story, you know, it's the same as documentary filmmakers. They get this all the time. It is, if you film something, if you're, I don't know if you've ever seen a lot of, um, I'm trying to think of what this is back, um, Killer Well is a film, a documentary about, I think it's called Black Fish or something like that. And basically, yeah. regardless of how, you could all get the same footage, but how you tell the story is down to the filmmaker themselves. So, going to your point something that you're looking for is the point that you want to express that is the most important thing so if, if it's different if a client comes to me because obviously they've got bullet points of what they want mm -hmm. so for example the latest one i've just my latest work actually for sussex police and university of brighton it was a case of we have to get these points across so as a filmmaker in, in i will look at that and go okay well that has to be tick 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 it has to be or if, there, if there's too many, which one's the most important? Yeah, it's, it's priority. Mm. And then it's a case of then I add my stuff in. But when I when I make a film professionally, um, I look at it as um, a filmmaker. So technical is the story there, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. Will the client be happy? So I look at it through the eyes of the client. And I also look through the eyes of the people that it's made for. So that's three boxes that I have to tick. So long as I've got all those points across, that's it. But regarding photography going into dabbling into filmmaking, I would suggest that, yeah, get your point, get your story. What do you actually want to say? What do you want to tell? Even if it's just a random selection of footage from holiday or in the garden or whatever you've been doing, what's the point of it? That's the, I have to say, that's the first thing I ever started doing with, with films was holiday-related footage, mm. you know, and trying to make that fun and interesting and something that's slightly more memorable than – you know, 1500 photos sat on your hard drive. <laughs> you want a three minute film, you can go watch, go, Oh God, that was a great holiday. So, you know, you know what I used to love when I was a kid and I used to make, uh, make a lot of like a little video movies was practical effects. 
I used to build models day in and day out and just, you know, shoot. You know, I used to like have Star Wars models and I used to kind of completely rebuild them, add things to them, mm-hmm. respray them. You know, I used to build like landscapes out of paper mash and boxes and sand and whatever else. And then, then put little sci fi stories together and, you know, light it and blah, blah, blah. Um, and all, you know, I shot off that on like a, a, a video eight consumer camera, basically. But actually, for me, it was like, uh, it was like building, yeah, building these things. Like building the sets, building the models, um, thinking about practical effects. That was always like the fun bit for me. And I can still see that in my photography now uh, because a lot of the time um, when I set up shots, I love the whole set building process. I just love putting the sets together, putting like 5 million details in there, putting little references in there that only I'll ever know or people who know me will ever <laughs> you know, recognize. Yeah. But the, the Star Wars reference is always in there somewhere, you know? Yeah. And that's 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 what I enjoy doing, um, and of course there's sort of a storytelling aspect to that uh, to that as well. But that for me was always like uh, that was the fun, the super fun part, and like working out camera moves. Like the the biggest difference for me as a stills photographer when I think about video is the fact that the camera can move, you know, through yeah. space, and I am endlessly fascinated by camera moves, whether they are done with things like gimbals or sliders. You know whether they are just whether there's just a hint of a move, or whether they're full on incredible uh, camera moves. Like there's a move you probably know this um, in Tom Cruise's version of War of the Worlds. Yeah, there's there's a camera move where he's with his with his family they're in this car, the only car that's running. They're basically bolting down the highway, trying to avoid lots of obstacles and. And cars that had you know broken down or whatever, and the camera follows that car, and it's it's a it's basically one long camera move that goes around the car, it goes through the car, inside the car, back around, outside, in front. It's just crazy. Half of it is CGI, of course, and half of it is actually live action. But it's just the way it's put together. Is you just go, well, but th- I don't know what is happening. How do they what? Yeah, <laughs> like well, oh, the simple so- terms. That's a robot. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> I know. <laughs> But it's like when you follow them, the movement is just incredible, you know? And of course, you might just watch, you might, well, so my wife would watch that movie and she would not necessarily even, t- you know, take that, take that in. Uh, this is always, this is like sort of a running joke between, between Nick and me. It's, it's really, you know, my wife, will, my wife went to film school and she was, um, she focused on script writing. That's her thing. Like, yeah, that's the dialogue, the story, that is her thing. You know, when we watch a movie together and I'd be like, Oh, I can't get over that color grade. That's amazing. And she'd be like, Yeah, but the story is shit and the dialogue sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're like, we'll watch the same movie with totally different eyes. Hmm. You know, which is- well, the, the thing is with that, so it's very, very good about that. So there's three areas that you've just covered there. So you've got the story part of it. So they're in this car, you love the movement of it. But the most fundamental part of that breakdown or breaking it down to its very core, what's the point of it? How did you feel when you watched it? That's the point. Mm. That, but all of camera movement that you do is purely to evoke an emotion. I mean, I use that term a lot, and that's the same back with photography. Mm. When you color grade, you want to evoke that emotion in someone. You know, even if it's black and white. What? Why did you choose black and white? You know, is there a point to it? You know, did it draw you in there? You know, is it? good versus bad. You know what I mean? You have all those things and that's exactly what camera movements will do. And you'll find that even when you go into photography to it. If I do a simple track, you know, forward and backwards, Mm. if I'm going backwards to reveal the character in his surroundings, you're emphasizing, oh, where they are. But this is why, you know, when someone does a, a, a serious bit of dialogue or anything like that, or even something important, they'll either shoot it here, so it's really tight. Yeah. So like, you know, see you close up. Or they'll start out and then I'll draw the camera in just slowly. And what that also does, that brings t- tension, you know, you know like tension in what they're saying. You're on the, you know, the edge of your seat. Mm. Yeah, and that's the um I love that. That is that is part of the, the filmmaking processes of yeah, you've got your story, you've got your actors, you've got the um what is it you want it to do? What they want to tell? Color grading, sound effect, but then the camera movement, just a little camera movement, even if you do it in post. So, for example, our photography friends don't have gimbals or anything like that. Put it on a tripod, that's absolutely fine. And then do a track, do a 
a little zoom in, just a slight zoom in post production. Mm. All the matters is just a film. All a filmmaker is is a uh, is a fixer upper. He does a problem solver. That's exactly what we are. That's all we are. <laughs> <laughs> Camera moves is an, is, a, is an interesting one. Like, just take that zoom in. You, you only have to go in a few percent. And you, as a viewer, you may not even notice that it's happening. But suddenly you're, just for argument's sake, 20 seconds into this particular scene or clip, and you're, you're so much closer to that, that subject. And it makes all the difference in the world, just that few percent. One, um, one thing I when I was first learning... One thing I had an, an issue with to get my head around is actually, oh, I want to be able to do this camera move, that camera move, whatever it might be. Yeah. And it's it's only when you get slightly more experienced you realise, actually, I'm not going to be able to do that camera move because in Hollywood, that's, that's, that's not done handheld. That's not done with a gimbal like we've done. They've got robots and all sorts doing things like all sorts of cranes and whatever they might be using. And... To, at a certain point, it almost disheartens you. You go, I can't, I can't do it. I can't get that. I can't, why can't I get that? And it's only when you realise, actually, you're not doing anything wrong, my friend. It's, <laughs> they're just really challenging moves and may, might not be something you've got the gear to do at home. Well, yeah, I, do you know what? It's, it's funny you say that because, you know, the point I was trying to make earlier about the, the Canon 5D Mark II that I had was it's never about the gear. Mm-hmm. You know, I was working with a camera when the 5D Mark II, when I bought the 5D Mark II, it was already five years old. It was old. And then I took it even beyond its peak. So, well, after its peak, should we say, and I took, I just worked it to the bone, as I said. I just did a film shoot. Um, it's a very tough one, actually, for uh, Kew Gardens. They do, glow, it's called Glow Wild. It's uh, East Sussex, West Sussex, can't think whether that's they are, but East Sussex is like sort of a, an event, should we say. And the point was, we can't go within certain metres of people because of COVID. Can't show masks because it's not exactly flattering. And then we have to fight with the weather. And the reason why I bring this up about gear um, is the saviour of the entire night was a vintage lens that I had. I even wrote it down here to make a point. It's the Helios Helios uh, 44 to to 58 millimeter f2. It's a, tw- it's a, I think it's like a 20 plus year old lens that I picked up for I think less than 60 quid. Yeah. And can I just add right on this shoot that I uh, it was it was just me and my um, my colleague. We've got a cinema camera, and we've got 15 grand worth of lenses, and I used primarily a 60 pound <laughs> vintage lens because <laughs> it worked for the shoot. It was added the character, it, you know, put lights in directly in front of the, the lens and it flared. It's never about what the equipment, it's more about like what you can do to fix the problem, should we say. You know, mm-hmm. you can spend all the money in the world and have the latest gear. Doesn't mean you're going to be a great filmmaker or photographer. It's it's what's in here in here. And that's really cheesy, but it's so true. I bought myself a, a, the Rain and S just a, a while ago. I've used it a couple of couple occasions because no other shoot has required it at all. Yeah. But I, there are, you know, there, there's the tendency out there to, oh, I've got it, I'm going to use it on everything. Mm. And oh no, there's nothing worse than seeing every video with sl- slider and gimbal shots going on the entire time. It's just too much, and it doesn't feel natural. It feels very YouTube, and uh, it's well, yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? You're fighting with the time. So my shooting style, you know, you were talking about earlier about movement, camera movement. My first ever shooting style that I picked up, every shot is moving. If you ever watch my, any of my work, every shot is moving. And believe it or not, I hated tripods. I refused to use them. And uh, my latest, work, again, for the Sussex Police one, um, I used a tripod. And the reason why I used a tripod because it was how to tell that story uh, you grow, you, you change as you grow. Yeah. So now I shoot on sort of telescopic lenses now, but I put them on a tripod, but I move the tripod to give me my movement and, mm-hmm. and I do it that way. Uh, again, purely for stylistic point of view and, and you know, and things like that. And, um, but yeah, you will change. Cause I, when I picked up with one of those Ronin S's, I, I used it for a lot of wide shots because I had to stabilize it. And then I found it became a bit of a nuisance on shoot. Um, but all it is, it's just a, a tour a technique to make you the story better. That's all it is. 
God, I, uh, we were talking about we mentioned the rain a couple of a couple of episodes ago, um, and uh, aren't they heavy? <laughs> They, uh, they certainly heavy. can be. Um, I've used huge ones. Uh, with the cinema camera that we've got yeah. is just a, a ton. And then when you've got like a double-handed one, it's just back-breaking. Yeah. And it's just, you think, oh, is it worth it? <laughs> but lucky enough with technology, you've got the new cinema cameras come out now that can fit on top of a Ronin S, for example. And and that's what that's my next camera. That's the next camera I want. It's not as good as the cinema camera I have at, at the office. But it's a, again, it's just a tool, a technique that works for my that, that works for my style. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, but don't ever get bogged down regarding equipment. You know, you were saying earlier on about um, film techniques. Going online, as much as I love going on Instagram and seeing people's creative work and that, if you ever watch the Hollywood ones or or, or supr- people with all the equipment, it immediately makes you feel down. Mm. You're like, well, how am I meant to do that? And the point is, you're right, it's a challenge, isn't it? Well, how can, so our company's sort of ethos is we provide a big look for hardly, for hardly any budget because we haven't got the tools, but we still offer the level of quality, the level of storytelling. But we might not have a car with a crane on top with a camera. When I started out in college, I learned Premiere Pro, video editing. Yeah, And then I... What did I go into next? I think I dabbled a little bit into... No, I went to university. That, that was the thing after college. Because my history is very varied. I, I actually gave up on filmmaking, but I'll go into that if you ever want to go know about it. And um, I went to university and I said, I edit on Premiere. And my lecturer time, Ugh, Premiere? <laughs> and <laughs> I'm like, okay, what should I learn with? So then I learned Avid, Media Composer, which is what they use in film and TV. And then I learned Final Cut X. And again, it's, and the lesson I, I learned from that, and now I'm back on Premiere, it doesn't matter what you edit on, as long as your story's there, or you're happy with the tools that you can deliver the look, feel, whatever you're trying to deliver. That's all that matters. Mm-hmm. doesn't matter, does it? You know? Totally, man. Totally. So we, we've talked about this many times, you know, in terms of photography, because obviously um, we, get, we get that kind of question um, a lot. Like, you know, what, what kind of camera gear do you shoot? Like, you know, are you a Nikon guy? Do you shoot Canon or Sony, whatever? Um, yeah. The truth is um, that, it, I mean, I always say this, like, it really doesn't matter to me. Give me a camera, you know, and I, I can use any camera. I, literally, mm-hmm. it really doesn't make a, a difference to me whatsoever. I like the camera system that I use because I'm familiar with it. I've used it for a long time. It feels good in my hands, all of that kind of jazz. Um, and I spent a lot of money on lenses. That's the other thing, but the truth is, I don't. I, you know, I could, I could. I'm pretty. Sh- I'm well, pretty confident I get the same results. You know, shooting a different brand, for example. Um, and so the considerations uh, that that I would have in terms of like moving to a different system, for example, would not be around necessarily. Can you know around the, the images themselves? It'd be more like, you know, is it considerably lighter to carry around? Mm. You know, that sort of thing. Um, does it give me any additional advantages in terms of, I don't know, does it tether better? Does it have, well, I don't know, Wi-Fi built in or Bluetooth? Or you, you know, there are other other issues that may make my life easier in order to complete my job. If that's the case, if something makes my life easier, I'm in, <laughs> basically. That's what, that's what it's about, isn't it? But also, does it offer you what you want to do? Yeah. So I, my current my current camera that I, that I own is I shoot with the Sony A7S II. So that's mm. old now. They, you know, it's, it's really old. I'm, I'm pushing it again past its its lifespan because I've got the three out now. But the reason I've got it is because of low light. And I wanted mm. to be able to offer clients, oh, you, you want to film a night walk? Let's go. I've got it. I've got it. And then, but now as time's gone on, because you, you start to get the way that you, what you want. So for me, for example, I've got my eye on the, I like the red system. You know, there's people that shoot on the RE systems, which are like mm. ridiculously expensive. You know, like the, the camera that we, we currently own in house is a 35,000 pound camera and it's just a body. There's no lenses, there's no batteries, there's no mm. handle. The handles are grand. And you think, what? But now they've made um, a smaller version, it does everything that the bells and whistles that does, apart from some of the, the shutter speed, so I can't do because I like to under crank my camera, and under cranking means uh, you change the frame rate, so it does different effects, does different visual effects, um, and then basically you can't do that. 
but the, the color science is again what I love. Mm. The color science makes my heart melt. I'm like, I've got to have it. I would throw this table out the window if I could get my hands to it. Mm. Um, because that's what I want. But you know, in the case of I've got to work with the Sony to save up, you know, especially nowadays, it's even going to take even longer, especially with the current um, life. And, uh, but that's what I want. I want that because it helps me become a better, well, it's just another tool, isn't it? That's what I want really. So regarding photography, there might be a lens that you think I really want to dabble in it, maybe hire it first and then purchase it. And, you know, and then you realize how different you're applying your style to a different perspective or a different angle. And then you feel confident, you grow. And then you think, Oh yeah, they've got a, got another like, spanner or something on my tool belt. Yeah. I love it. It's just, it's just fantastic. Do you mentioned uh, frame rates there earlier? And that's of course something I think that gets many photographers uh, confused when they first make that jump into, into video is of course, now you have to consider frame rate and frame rate is, is just simply how many frames per second you shoot. But there are lots of differences. You know, you hear uh, people talking about 24 frames per second, 25, 30, 60, or 120. Yeah. Um, and I think especially when it when it comes to like 24, 25, and 30, there's always a lot of confusion around like well, which one of those, it seems so similar. Like, is there really a difference between 24 and 25 or 30? Like, what's your take on that? The answer is regarding frame rate. Yes, it is important because um, the director, I see James Cameron did Terminator 2, I can't think off the top of my head. He took a frame out of that movie all the way through to one frame out of every second and it completely broke the film. So when it comes to which, sort of which film, film was that? I think it's Terminator Two. Oh, I must have seen that version. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, I don't think it was ever released. It was just a case of, a, a, right. of an experiment, and uh, yeah. it, that would have been a twenty-four frames per second. Mm. Um, but when you go into filming for the first time, stick with twenty-five frames per second if you're in the UK. Twenty thirty frames per second is is more of American you know, soil type thing. Um, if your camera doesn't show 25, but it shows 30, then then just shoot with 30. That is what it is. It just, it does give you a little bit more fluid motion. That's what it is. It's all about motion. Same as um, when you watch something in 60 frames per second, it flows better. 120 frames per second. I'm talking more gaming terms here. You know, they go up to 240 frames because it's just, it just doesn't look real. I think it was The Hobbit films they changed the frame rate and so when people watched it they absolutely hated it even though the director um said it was actually better organically for your eye it just people hated it but 24 frames is got that film look it's what we've grown up with it's what we were used to mm. so another frame on over here you don't really ever notice it it's just a case of um shoot with what you're you're comfortable with um first and go from there but regarding slow motion, that's when you need more frame rate. So that's more photographs per second. Mm -hmm. So for the basic term, if I'm saying 25 frames, that's 25 photographs a second. If I'm saying 100 frames per second, I'm taking 100 photographs a second. Um, it just means that when you go to slow down time, should we say, it, you've got more frames there to, to do that nice slow motion. And that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Hope that answers your question. Absolutely, yeah. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, about your latest project, What's in Your Pocket, because yeah. you've sort of alluded uh, to that a little bit earlier. Um, I have to say, I, I watched it the other day, and I'm trying to find words. It's utter garbage. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing, actually. I'm trying to find words to describe how it made me feel, um, because... I remember coming to the end of that and and uh, I was almost like I was sort of emotionally drained I would say because um because it's about well, I'll let you explain what it's about but basically it's it really uh, it involves teenagers and I have I have two stepchildren who are that age and so it had an immediate personal effect on me if that makes any sense. So I'll let you explain what that um, whole project was about. So what's in your pocket is, um, it's a client, actually. It was, we, so Smokescreen Visual, if you want to watch this film, if you go to smokescreenvisuals.co.uk, 
Um, it's on our homepage of our, the company's website. It's at the bottom there. You just click it and watch it. Um, originally, the, the client, so it was the University of Brighton and uh, Sussex Police came to us and said, this is the idea of what we want. What we want to do is show... Uh, it's, it's difficult to put into it. It's a case of not to show you taking drugs is bad, but to show you if you do take drugs, think about how it got to you and what's attached to that. So, you know, the other side of the coin is basically kind of what they said. And then so I sat there we through this meeting, going through everything and understanding what it what it is that they want. And then I came up, as I said earlier, you were talking about um, how do I add the story ahead of time on the cuff or whatever mm. for this? I had, I didn't have the story cause it wasn't written yet. So I, I actually didn't write it. I co wrote it with them, but it was actually two university of Brighton students that did that. Um, sort of gave them tips of where the story should go through my years of watching films. And, uh, all I had in my mind was the shooting style, how to make someone feel, as you said, emotionally drained and how to show the character visually with hardly any dialogue because you never the, the protagonist that you that you follow um they never speak and and there's kind of like a reveal you don't know who it is if that makes sense when you what were you know cursing because you've watched it um so there was that element to it i had no idea how to shoot the style that i wanted to shoot i know i've seen it in films and i wanted it it was my favorite director um style um, that was similar, um, and that was Tony Scott. He was—he he is my favourite director, even still today. Even though he's not no longer making films, sadly, because he ended his own life. Um, so I pitched that idea to the client. I said, "Look, this is the idea. I showed a man on fire, um, taken Pelham one, two, three, and what it is is a style in it called um, when it's, great. it's almost like films are fast. Films fast forwarded is the only way to explain it, but it's not." Mm. And what that is, that's called an undercrank. Um, so again, I mentioned it earlier, you change the frame rate. So a lot of martial art films do this. They will still fight, still shooting the fight scene at 24 frames a second. They'll shoot it maybe 20 or 22. So when you, so when you see a kick come round, it suddenly goes from here to here. And that, and when you play that back at normal frame rate, so 25 or 24, it looks like it's going really quick. Mm. Um, but it isn't. Um, and so, the idea was to 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 use that style in a film to to depict someone's well really bad situation really as an awareness film so um so to answer your question it is a film about raising awareness on not where drugs come from but the repercussions of if you purchase some drugs what will you know what's happening on the other side how did it get to your pocket so to speak but that project is everything i've learned throughout the years and again as i said earlier i had no idea how to do it i just pitched it to them they said you've got it you've, you've won the pitch hmm. and then my boss matt went to me how are we gonna do that and i said don't you worry i'll figure it out and and so i did i um i practiced and i learned and and did stuff like that but yeah it, it that film it's a case of using i use a lot of dutch angles or russian angles mm -hmm. so it's slanted and the reason why you want to do slanted is a great way to, and again, that actually comes from photography. I learned that doing photographs mm. is how to show that someone's under pressure or, or something's not quite right. Um, and you know, slanted angles are the way mm. forward. And I absolutely love that look now. Um, and the same as you change the frames per second or, but also what I did is it, the undercrank, I also changed the F stop or in my case, I was shooting cinema glass so ST mm -hmm. all the time. So not only am I changing the speed, I'm changing the amount of light that hits the sensor. Mm -hmm. I can only do it on cinema cameras because it's a case of it's completely flawed. It just goes all the way around. It's motion. Mm -hmm. So but F-stop glass, it doesn't like photography glass. It, it judders. But you can do it in post-production, which I also mm -hmm. did a little bit of. Just for um, uh, you know, those of you, <clears throat> excuse me, those, those watching that may not, um, maybe looking at their camera now going, well, I can only see 24 and 30 here. How, how do I film at 20 and 22? I'm guessing that's uh, a speciality of the, uh, the red there. 
it is, but it also isn't because how if you can take a time lapse. So there's one shot in that film where I didn't have. I wanted it shot at eight frames per second. So I was shooting a lot of the film in eight frames per second. Anything jarring, it plays, it films in eight frames. But when you play it back normally, it's almost like it's been fast forwarded. But there's one shot in there that I filmed it at 24. I decided to go 24 frames. I've never done 24 before. I wanted to give it that more of a filmic look. And because uh, it is, a, at the end of the day, it's a short film. It turned into, a, it was a campaign, a short 30 second, one minute, to suddenly it turned into a seven minute film. And it only feels like you're sitting there for three. And people just love it because of, of, of what it is. It's a little bit of Hollywood, really. Um, but one of them I shot 24 frames. And all I did was right click it in post production, so in Premiere, and I changed its speed to 25%. And it juddered, but it looked perfect. Just, mm. I was like, well, yeah, it fits. So if you can't do it in your camera, there will always be a way to do it in your editor. If you're, I don't know about Windows Movie Maker or anything like that. I've never, I don't know if you have <laughs> the tools for it, but um, it's no different from taking the time lapse. If anyone's done a time lapse, it's you can change because my Sony, for example, only shoots twenty five, thirty, and a hundred. I think it's really basic, so I would never be able to undercrank on that, except if I shot. 25 frames per second and then changed it in the editor it would judder but then it, it doesn't work for every project it worked for that story mm-hmm. and that was and that's, and that's why i did it it's purely down to, again down it's boring to say down to your story <laughs> <laughs> that's not boring man that's you're hammering home a, the m- most critical point of making any film and you know it's uh, you could say it 20 more times in the next 10 minutes and that still wouldn't be enough to get the point home to people that it really is all about the story. That's the, you know, that's, that's the thing about it. It's a case of if you ever want to see a film that's a little bit of Hollywood, but shot in for like a ridiculously low budget. Um, and I, I'm, I'm proud to say that I think it's my best work mm-hmm. because it's years of shooting style. And obviously then having to face with COVID difficulties and, you know, all wearing masks on set and we're only allowed a short crew and mm. and half of it is shoulder rig or shoulder, um, tripod. There's no sort of like running gun motions. Um, it was, again, it's just purely down to, there's three different styles in it. There's a little bit of slow motion, there's under cranking, as I said, and there's normal speed, but then it's the angles that I do a lot. Um, mm. But yeah, it's a case of try out everything. Every time I make a film, I experiment. And then the next time I go to do it, I kind of know how to do it or I try it a little bit different. And that's the same with photography. Just try something different, you know, even if it's in post-production, if you just want to do a little bit more of the color grading, just dab a little bit or start doing durotones. You know, I started doing them now. I love doing that stuff. You've got like, it looks a little bit like Spotify. I didn't know how to do it. I just did it. And now I love it. So I've now got a beautiful orange R2D2 to go on on smokescreen website. (laughs) The other thing I just wanted to uh, sort of um, uh, to to really just chat about very very briefly is the sort of uh, how do you see the sort of current state of the kind of the film industry um, at this at this moment? Because um, I'm saying this because one of our local cinemas has just shut down, which is highly annoying. <laughs> yeah. Um, so are you referring to actual? proper full feature films or like as in film festivals or are we talking about sort of youtube content creators and everyday joe what's well, it's a little bit it's a little bit of both because obviously um in the kind of movie industry as such um and you know this is something that that really applies to to where we live because both nick and me live um not too far from pinewood studios so there's a lot of of uh, the movie industry is in you know at our doorstep here um of course, a lot of uh, a lot of movies at the moment are being released online rather than uh, rather than in cinemas, and of course that has an impact on cinemas and uh, and you know cinemas viability. And you know, referred over the last few months that that even uh, big nationwide uh, chains have run into trouble because of that. Um, but then, of course, on the other hand, there's there's an upside. This is kind of how I feel about it: is that is that because of COVID, there's of course a lot more need for video in general, whether that's for social media or online generally, um, yep. because that's how we how we communicate 
in this, you know, during, throughout this pandemic, it's basically via a screen. And so I sort of, my feeling is, and I, you know, I'm wondering whether you agree with me or, or you know, what, what I want to, basically I want to hear what your take on this is, is that actually there may very well be an opportunity in video at this time. Before COVID, it was Netflix. Mm. Netflix, Amazon Prime, they changed the way. Because it's about, yeah, granted, jobs are still happening. You know, they're making content, but there's mm. so much. It's just flooded, isn't it? It's instantly to you. That was affecting the cinema already. Mm. There was day releases like um, uh, like certain movies would release day on day, cinema and uh, Netflix or, or mm. online streaming. So the thing is with the cinemas, they might be closing now, but they will they will come back because people don't have cinemas at home. They don't have the luxury of beautiful head 300, 400 pound headphones that they can just absorb it and they go to cinema because it's the experience. You'll never take that away. That will come back in time. Um, regarding sort of releasing stuff online and things like that, so. You know, is it HBO? Was it? I think it was them that's just put like the brand new, you know, in Disney Plus, they've just put the brand new Soul Pixar film, which I watch, which is fantastic. They become their own entity at the end of the day. They, the, the, is it Wonder Woman? I think that one was a bit different because that was actually meant for cinema release. And maybe the Pixar one was, but it's, I just see it as you should be happy just to be able to consume the content. Mm. I feel like it, Today's date, sadly enough, is you make something, you put it out, and it's gone by tomorrow. Mm. And that's the, the sad thing of it. Um, but there will be the odd person that will remember it because it made an impact on them. You know, like for me, one of my favourite film ever is Days of Thunder. I'm not huge on NASCAR. I just love everything about it, but I love Top Gun. Mm. But why are they so good even today? Because they were made brilliantly. They were made the best of the best rather than just spewing out content that has no greatness or no, no substance to it you're not going to remember it this is what irritates me a little bit about sort of like youtube and things like that. as much as i love the video content i'm on there every day for it it's people that will pick up like the camera that i'm desperate to buy but because i've got no money i can't buy it and they'll just pick it up and they'll film anything with it and it's just like they don't care about the craft that they're doing mm. It's almost like, and it's a case of, I have to work extra harder. And same as the child, you have to work extra harder because the camera's doing it all for them. Mm. But then that's where I found my niche in storytelling because, yeah, you might be able to pick up a camera and film and do beautiful slow motion and whatnot, but you mm. don't have the story or you don't have my shooting style or, or your view, the viewer's shooting style. Does that make mm. sense? Yeah. yeah. Find that something special that, some might be able to copy or duplicate. You know, you might watch, you know, what's in your pocket, my latest short film, and be like, "Well, it looks exactly like Tony Scott." Or, well, it's it's heavily inspired by him, but it's not him shooting it. He, he's got fifty thousand pound lens on the front of his, which does things that mine does not. And yeah, so and that's sort of a bit of a tangent away from how do I see cinema going or film, you know, that sort of going. It's not going anywhere, but it, it's just. It's easily to have something lost, I feel, at the moment, um, due to the fact that there's so much content. If you said, if I said to you guys, what are you watching at the moment? I'm sure you've got about five or six on the go. Because... Seven, yeah. eight, nine, <laughs> ten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's, um, yeah, and that's, the, uh, that's the difficult bit of it, unfortunately. Mm. Every single episode of The Mandalorian all at the same time. That's... Uh, yeah, I, uh, I did that over a few days. And again... I love that because what does it bring? It brings the aesthetics from the first three films, mm -hmm. not the latest, not the latest three, which everyone complained about. Same as why you've got, again, it's about story, isn't it? You know, if you're in the Cobra Kai series on Netflix, yeah. I did that all in one night. I was, I was, because <laughs> I was at home because of COVID, I thought I set up a tent, me and the daughter, you know, we do some camping indoors. I, I, I think I bet you about 4 a.m. I just watched the entire series because what it is nostalgia and something new and again it's about the story yeah it's just there's too much content <laughs> I'm afraid I have one issue with Cobra Kai yeah. and it was in the first season first couple of episodes there's this scene where Johnny's driving and drinking out of a brown paper uh, bag, like bag yeah. you know and it is possibly the worst filmed and worst acted scene 
in TV history. <laughs> it's, it's all doing flashbacks and all that, and he's there like this. Oh, oh it's just so badly acted. Rest of it, it love it. It's, <laughs> it's worse. It's, it's down to budget. It, I tell you, for me, the, the worst scene in cinema history is uh, in the Phantom Menace when uh, Anakin's little Anakin Skywalker um, meets uh, Padme for the first time, and the line is, "Are you an angel?" <laughs> Whoever wrote that, that scene should be cut. That is, oh, <laughs> that makes me throw up every time a little bit. But that's house. the thing, isn't it? You know, it's personal <laughs> preferences. So Absolutely. again, going back to you know. Just bring it up again, uh, what's in your pocket. As much as I made that for the client, I, I made it for the viewers and, and something that I wanted to create. So, but there'll be people watching go, oh, I don't like this at all. But that's yeah. fine. It's great to have opinion. We're all the same. We'd be boring. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I say this about photography all the time. Um, you know, uh, f- different photographers are different. You know, we all create different art uh, to a degree. And some people like one thing and some people like something else. Uh, you know, um, which is great because if it, if it was all the same, it'd be incredibly boring. And because it's all different, it gives us all an opportunity to discover new things all the time. You know, and that's a, I think for any creative, you know, no matter what we're talking photography or, or filmmaking or, um, or painting or whatever, um, it's the beauty of it is, is that there's always something new to discover. You know, mm. that's some, something, you know, sometimes you see something and it, it, it throws a total curveball and you kind of go, wow, what? And that's done how? And, you know, you, you get this sort of, um, this kind of eureka moment where you go, oh, I understand now, you know? And you've learned another thing and you put that, you know, you put that in your toolbox. Um, the next time you, you do something, um, you have that that new tool available, you know, to uh, to create your own art. And that's, that's always, uh, you know, I find that extremely, that's why, you know, these podcasts are so useful really, because we end up talking to so many different people who come from so many different angles and, um, there hasn't been a single episode. I say, I say this pro- probably every week, but, uh, there hasn't been a single episode where, where I haven't learned something new, you know, and it may not necessarily be, I'm not a landscape photographer and we've, you know, or a wildlife photographer, but we've, you know, we've spoken to, uh, to wildlife photographers on the program, there's still something I've picked up. And the next time I shoot a car, I know how to use these landscape-based ideas to make that image look even better. So it's, uh, you know, that's the kind of, that's the beauty of, of art in general, I think, but especially visual art. Absolutely. And it changes as you get older. It, yeah. And as your style, as I said earlier, I don't like, and I hate your tripod. I refuse to use them. Mm. Where now, I love them. And, and I'm able to do things. Oh, God, it takes a little bit more time to set it up. And yep. obviously, if you're doing an event, you can't do that. But in a controlled environment, I've got a way to do something. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but yeah, it's just a case of you, you will change over time. And and you'll only change for the better. And if, yeah. Because even if you, everyone goes, oh, I don't like your latest work or oh, I think your old work's better. Well, you're, it doesn't matter because it's do you like it, for example. And if you don't think, oh, actually, I'm going to go back to how I used to do it, you'll take little nuggets, should we say, from the stuff that you try, you know, experiment with, and then you'll, you'll just, yeah, you just get better with age. Yeah. You, you think of yourself like a bit of wine. Yeah. You only get better with age. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned tripods. You know, I had a, I sort of had a, I changed my mind about um, about tripods uh, myself really a few years ago because uh, originally. Uh, when I used to uh, do headshots and portraits in particular, I used to like the the whole freedom of not using a, a tripod. And I used to like not understand why some photographers would would shoot with a tripod because I kind of, I used to think like, well, but it kind of it totally impedes your movement. You know, you can't change yeah. the angle quickly. It's just you know you don't you can't be as creative when you're when you've got your camera stuck on a tripod. Um, and uh, you know, I just thought I just couldn't understand why you would shoot like that. And it wasn't until um, I spoke to um, to a friend of mine who's who's an incredible headshot photographer, and I, you know, we had this conversation, and he said, like, you know, the thing is, it allows me to communicate with the model or with the client much more easier because I'm not shooting them with the camera in front of my face. I can step away from the camera. I can tell them how to move. I can, you know, get them to mirror me. Um, so it, it it just allows me to connect with the client much better than constantly having that camera in front of my face. And that makes perfect sense. I tried it and I have to say, I probably never go back. It's It just makes my life actually so much easier. I thought it would be, uh, an what's the word? An impediment, <laughs> you know, but yeah. actually, it actually frees you up because 
in a photograph, when you, when you take somebody's photograph, um, it's, uh, it's so important to connect with that person. And, you know, it, it's, it's hard to believe how much having this, this camera machine between you and another human, how much that takes away from, from being able to make that, act, that connection. So that's a, you know, it's been a real, that was a real eye opener. And so, you know, for the last, I don't know, five, six years, I've been shooting uh, with a tripod pretty much exclusively. I may take the camera off at the end. You know, just to, to get to get a little bit of a different perspective. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. funny, isn't it? Like having a piece of equipment in front of you can change the one. I've done it before. You get a these really confident people that you're about to film an interview. The moment you put the camera down, they just turn. It's like deer in headlights, and you're like, "Whoa, yeah, yeah. okay." Let's put the camera down. Normally, half the time, actually, I keep the camera recording, mm. even though most people don't that. And I talk to them off screen, and and you normally get a little bit of natural um, look to it. But yeah, it's it's easily. It's easily done. It's just a art is just a crazy thing, isn't it? As yeah. I mentioned, um, I almost gave it up once upon a time ago after you know going into it, but that was from like college and stuff because it's so saturated. You know, photography, videography. How do you and you get that whole um, stipulation of, oh, you're on a media course. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're a bit of a flunky. Yeah, it's the case of um, yeah. I, after I finished college, I was I was just like. I don't know what to do with myself now. Very often when you watch interviews like this, you know, um, the first question is always like, how did you get into blah, blah, blah? Or what was your starting point? Um, we, you know, I love interviews that don't start like that. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, <laughs> okay. it's always like, it's the most boring thing. I always find like when, you know, when, but the first question is, so how did you start in filmmaking or how did you start in photography? Um, and then, because then very quickly it becomes sort of biographical, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Whilst, um, and then it's, it's really easy to kind of miss out on, on, on much more interesting, um, story. Sorry, yeah. yeah. In there. So, so that being said, now that we've come to, uh, you know, almost the end of, of this episode, um, why don't I ask you that exact question? Like, how did you actually get started in filmmaking? Basically it was by chance, I think. It was a case of, I always loved movies. Everyone loves movies, didn't they, as a kid? My favourite film when I was six years old was Predator. I was growing up on dark sci-fi. I'm a massive nerd. Like, I have, like, rare collectibles behind me. I collect. I'm a big nerd. But then that inspires me as a filmmaker today. I have random ideas. Um, I grew up, I actually wanted to film Big Cats. That's what I always wanted to do. And it was a case of, can't do that. Okay, no worries. That was always my, my dream. My other dream was to actually make computer games. So I was always full of stories. I used to play a lot as a kid, a lot of toys and that. And um, it was a case of you either have to be good at art or coding. And I wasn't very good at either. So I thought I'll go down the easier road and went down to art. Did the first year of art. You know, you're 16. You don't give a monkey, do you? Just that's it. And then I didn't fail. I passed it. Mm. But out of determination, I was like, I'm going to do this course again. I did the same course. So pretty much wasted a year. And in that year, they introduced a module called filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And so, and out of all the whole year or whatever it was that, you know, you got all different modules, merits and things like that. That was the only thing I got a distinction in. So I thought, well, let's actually try it again. So that year of that art course, I got a merit. So I went on past to a merit and then I did filmmaking. And then I got, I got on really well with the lecturer there. So much so, even today I talked to him and I sent him what's in your pocket and he sent me a version back, black and white, and all oh, years later, I actually sold that Canon 5D Mark II to, to him. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I've always had this relationship, you know, everyone I meet, I normally mm. tend to keep in contact, even if it's years down the line. Mm. And anyway, so I did college, got a distinction. Then I did a, another year of three, two years. I got a triple distinction. That's when I knew I found my calling. Mm. And then, uh, and it went from there, really. But when I left college, it was a case of, you know, it's oversaturated. I worked in London for a bit for film company or TV companies mm. where you're just a runner making teas and coffees and things like that. And you worked in the kitchen. You didn't work in the technical department, mm. just the kitchen. And I remember one guy coming in, putting his leg up on the table and said, I want a cup of tea. And I was like, well, there's the kettle. There's the tea bags. Off you go. Mm. So I knew I wasn't made for that environment. I wanted to be a small person in a small tea. Oh, Maybe a big person in a in a small team that has a number, the not rather than number the name. So as we're talking about Cobra Kai, or my nickname at work's Cobra. So 
it's a cobra kai so it, it's um so i found that and then i went to university and then and went up and up from there but i i ended up leaving so but thanks to university i made a short film for, for my university um which i then sent around looking for a job so i knew i wasn't cut out for london due to the fact that i wanted a bit of a family i like the, the coastal life and uh, it was a case of I sent that short film, which was called Peacekeeper at the time. I think he's still on YouTube, like a masked police officer. And uh, with Matt, my boss at Smokes and Visual, picked up and said, do you uh, fancy working a little bit of um, freelance? Like, I'll call you in. And I went, all right, no worries. Because we had very similar shooting styles. So that's, the, you know, lesson learned is if you ever see someone that you share a passion with shooting style-wise, mm. you know, definitely you, you end up connecting with them. And, and, yeah, so ever since then I've been – with sort of smokescreen visual. So very quickly, that's how I got into filmmaking was um, was by accident, but also had a little bit of a passion for it as a kid, like watching movies and stuff. So nothing really interesting, but the thing is learn from it. Don't ever give up. And that's what mm. I teach. Um, if I do teaching now, that's what I do mm. is never give up. You know, I was, a, I got no GT, well, I did get GTDs, but very poor grades, like ridiculously bad. Mm. Didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And then I found something that inspired me and, I would do it for free if I could. Like, I don't ever feel like I work. Does that make sense? I'm sure you guys feel <laughs> yeah. the same. You just love your job. Yeah, it's stressful yeah. and it's long hours, but you love it. And that's mm. the thing that hopefully viewers at home or, or wherever they're watching you also get with their own photography mm. and hopefully now going forward, their video. So what's your, um, what have you got in the pipeline for 2021? <laughs> so here I am thinking, that's it. Lockdown again, mm. nothing to do. And it then a client has come back to me and said, because of lockdown, can you make me some videos that we can now share at home? So I've got that and potentially more of a sporty thing that's come through yesterday. You just, it's really odd. You just never know. But hopefully, I have a very uh, colourful future, I'm hoping. But it's hard to say, isn't it? I, I, don't, I don't have anything long-term lined up. Um, it's just a case of roll with the punches. And sadly, that my, as, that's exactly what I do. My wife hates it. Mm. She's literally, every time you get out of a hole, you're back in a hole, because, or like work-wise, that is. But that's yeah. the joy of being freelance, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. As well as other bits and bobs. Absolutely. Well, Kai, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Yes. Um, and well, thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm pretty sure that we'll be working together again on some project um, at some point, hopefully in 2021. That's what I'm hoping anyway. Yeah, I think I think we will do. and. Uh, yeah, but yeah, again, thanks for having me and hopefully I didn't bore everyone to death and uh, <laughs> and, and um, hopefully you feel inspired just to dabble a little bit into video. Yeah. You know, it, it will make your photography 20 times better because you you appreciate what you're doing. Mm. And at the same time, you're taking techniques that you've now learned and yeah. applying them to your photography. So that's fantastic. 100%. And of course, you know, if if you're, especially if you're in the UK and, and, uh, you know, and we are in lockdown number, I've lost track. Is it number three, four? I can't remember. I think we're in three now. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, and if you're, if you're struggling to come up with something to do with your camera, then, you know, switching on the video function on it and just trying to shoot a little bit of video with it, maybe getting into that might be a really good idea. You know, if, because we had that um, at the beginning of of the first lockdown, I remember this is you know uh, Nick mentioned the the photo video chat that we that we do on a Tuesday night on on Zoom. Um, that was really born out of you know us just getting lots of uh, lots of messages from people saying like oh you know I haven't picked up my car uh, my my camera for three weeks or for four weeks it's still in the back you know because I can't go out and shoot wildlife like I would normally do or I can't do portraits because we can't get close to any people you know. Um, and then we we decided to come up with this, you know, to just meet on Zoom once a week and just talk about it, you know, so that, you know, people realize that actually they're not they're not alone in in feeling frustrated with that. There's, you know, everybody's in the same boat. And if just by talking about that, maybe we come up with some awesome ideas, you know, for people to to try out. And that's really then it sort of turned into um, a weekly thing, and then it turned into uh, you know almost like a sort of a Photoshop tutorial kind of thing, which I did every week. Um, and yeah, you know, it's really it's really good fun, and we'll we'll pick that up again. We've slowed it down a little bit over Christmas. <laughs> I think we'll be picking that up again within the next week or so. Um, now that we're back in lockdown, but um, but yeah. So if you don't know what to do, try out some video. I think that's the message for today. So we have come to the end of episode thirty nine of the Camera Shake podcast. Um, if you're 
watching this on YouTube and you haven't subscribed that uh, yet, then uh, you know just hit that subscribe button and the bell and all the bells and whistles and all that. Leave us a comment as well. That's always fun. Um, alternatively, if you're listening to the audio version of this uh, podcast and you're on Apple Podcasts, just scroll all the way down and leave us a little review, give us a little star rating because that helps our show to be found, strangely enough. Um, but it's also always good to know what you uh, what you think. Um, likewise, if you're listening in Colorado Springs, then just uh, let us know who you are, what you do, and what you like about the show. Uh, just send us an email on cameraShakePodcast at gmail.com or hit us up on Facebook. Same thing. Twitter, we're at... Nick, what's our Twitter handle? I can't remember. Shake Camera. Oh, it's at Shake Camera. That's right. Because apparently, at Camera Shake Podcast wasn't available. I don't know why. This doesn't make any sense. In any event... Um, that's it. Have a good week. We'll be back next Thursday with another amazing guest. Uh, but for now, that was episode 39.